Hello everyone, this is Mike Howard and I am here with Beth Howard and we're going to do a Bible study. We're in the book of 2 Kings. It's our 11th lesson in 1 and 2 Kings and the title of this lesson is God Judges. We are, as you're getting your Bibles out, we're in 2 Kings chapter 17. Before we launch into the lesson, uh, we've noticed that there are a lot more people viewing the lessons than before. And some of you who are new may not know the background. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to shoot a video explaining more of our testimony. But uh, the short version is uh, Beverly and I started doing these videos uh, when COVID started. And then I made a mistake and got a week ahead. And then a friend of mine who was using the lessons to help him prepare his lesson uh, asked me if we could just stay a week ahead. So if you're in the curriculum, uh, which is uh, uh, LifeWay's uh, uh, Explore the Bible uh, series, uh, you probably know that we're a week ahead of where the literature says, and that's the reason why. So it's to help the people who are Sunday school teachers uh, use the lesson uh, to help them study. So that's the background, and we'll do a little bit more later in a separate video. But let's get started with today's lesson. We're wrapping up our study of First and Second Kings. As a matter of fact, today the hammer comes down on the northern kingdom. That means that God's going to execute judgment on their bad behavior. Now we know that God is a good judge, but let's talk a little bit about judging. So the definition of to judge means to form an opinion or render a conclusion, to decide or to determine. We also know that a good judge, when you think about a court of law, the good judge gathers evidence, that would mean facts about the case, and then the judge evaluates without bias. And that's the reason that the justice person here who's holding the scales has a blindfold on because they're supposed to not have bias. And we all have our biases, but God is a God who doesn't have bias. And then the judge, if it's a good judge, decides the innocent or the guilt of the case based on the law. Now, in the state of Florida, our governor has just removed uh, a judge because they refuse to, actually it's a, a, a district attorney, uh, because they refuse to enforce the laws of Florida. But that means that they're not good at that because they've got a sworn, uh, they've sworn to, uh, to take care of those laws. So a good judge actually judges based on whatever the laws are in the books. They don't make stuff up. So there you have it. So now what about God? What kind of judge is God? First of all, according to Psalms chapter nine, verse eight, God rules the world in righteousness. That means that he's a righteous God and he judges the peoples with equity. That means that he doesn't have biases on how he judges, doesn't judge one person because they're cuter or richer or you know whatever. He doesn't have those kinds of biases. He judges based on rights, his righteousness. And then in Psalms 119, 68, uh, the psalmist says that uh, to God, you are good and what you do is good. Therefore, please teach me your decrees because your decrees come from your pure goodness. So if you're good, your decrees are good. So teach me those decrees. And then John says it a little different in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. Instead of talking about God being good uh, or righteous, he kind of switches the metaphor over to God is light. And he says, in God, there is no darkness at all. In other words, if you think of God being good, he's not on a scale of kind of good, mostly good, good most days. God is absolutely perfectly good. There can be no more good than God is good. So, and that's kind of what John was getting at with the light. So let's talk about, now that you've got the background, let's talk about God judges because today's lesson is, it's both sad, but it has a promise to it. So let's go. So Israel, now we've been going through uh, all of these kings and all of their rebellion and all of the idolatry that's come in because of uh, 
they're worshiping some of the Canaanite gods. And, and then the Phoenician god Baal got brought in with Jezebel and then it got taken over to Judah. So now that's permeated both the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. So we're beginning to see what ultimately is a spiral of idolatry and sin that is going to lead both the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom into exile. So it's time for judgment for idolatry and injustice are rampant. And, and to show you just how bad things have gotten in the Northern Kingdom, you remember a, a few weeks ago, we talked about Jehu who came, uh, became king and God used Jehu to kill Ahab and all of Ahab's family. But Jehu kind of got excited about doing that and got carried away so much so that not only did he kill Ahab, but he also killed the king of Judah at the same time. Just happened to be there. Might as well go ahead and take him out as well. But just in chapter 15, if you want to read an interesting chapter, chapter 15, a, a fellow by the name of Shalom killed the king of Israel, the current king of Israel. And then a, a paragraph later, Menahem killed Shalom and took over as king. And some of these kings were only kings for a couple of weeks. And then Pekah, a few weeks later, killed Menahem. And then Hosea came along and killed Pekah. That's a lot of killing. All of that, four kings were killed or assassinated. And so you can tell that the nation of Israel has kind of drifted into a lawless, um, godless place. And it is at that point in time that God says, that's enough. I'm giving up. So there's a promised exile in Deuteronomy 28 through 30. <clears throat> now, some people believe that, that the Bible or, or the Old Testament or the books of the law were completely lost. And as a matter of fact, in, in uh, I don't think it's next week's lesson, but the, the last lesson that we're going to have, they actually find a copy of the law and read it. And when they do, they're like, whoa, we didn't know this. Well, they should have known it because back in Deuteronomy 28 through 30, Moses is giving a speech to the nation before they cross the Jordan and they go into the promised land. And part of that speech, of course, is the, but the, uh, the, uh, the blessings and the curses. But during that speech, Moses reminds Israel of their covenant with God. And this covenant was the covenant that he made years, 40 years earlier when they came out of Egypt, he made this covenant based on the Ten Commandments. He said, he, then he lists the blessings if they obey the law and the curses if they disobey. And we talked a little bit about the curses uh, last week. But the ultimate curse is that God is going to remove them from the land. And that's their promised land. Uh, and, and also remove them from his very presence. So he's going to cut off fellowship with them, which is way worse than getting removed from the land. So the promised exile, we're going to get started in 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 5 and 6. The king of Assyria invaded the entire land. And this, when he says the entire land, it doesn't mean the southern kingdom. He's just talking about the northern kingdom here. He marched against Samaria. That was the capital of the northern kingdom. And he laid siege to it for three years. Remember a few lessons back, there was a siege in Samaria where the four lepers wandered out and found that the Ammonites had vacated their camp. They were sieging the city, but they heard thunderous chariots and they got scared and they left. This is the second siege of Samaria. And this one lasted three years and it ultimately resulted in the fall of the Northern Kingdom. So the 10 lost tribes, I'm sure you've heard of the 10 lost tribes. It's all of the tribes except Benjamin and Judah. Those tribes are lost. They were sent into exile, never to be heard from again. We don't see those tribes again until Revelation when God brings them back from all over the planet. So verse six, in the ninth year of Hosea, the last king of, Nor of the Northern Kingdom, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and he deported the Israelites back to Sir Assyria. He settled in, by the way, he also sent people from Assyria back into Samaria to inhabit that territory. So he kind of did a, a swap. He settled them in Hala, in Gozan, on the Habor River, and in the towns of the Medes. So they were sent into exile throughout uh, the Media Persian Empire, what became the Media and Persian Empire. So now we're going to switch to um, kind of a courtroom setting here. And the, the writer of this scripture is going to detail the case for us. So it's kind of like a court reporter. And so he's going to go through the details of what happened in, in this trial. 
So what's the crime? They violated their covenant. That's the crime. All of this took place, verse 7, because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of Egypt 700 years earlier from under the power of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Now think about 700 years. It's 2022 right now. So that's 1300, the year 1300. That's a long time ago. So it's been a long time since they came out of Egypt, but they had all of these wonderful things, uh, these wonderful festivals and feasts and priests that reminded them, should have reminded them of this covenant. They had three charges against them. The first charge was they worshiped other gods. The second charge, they followed the practices of the nations that the Lord had driven out before them. So the Canaanites who lived there, when they came in and took over, they didn't get rid of all the Canaanites. And as a result, they married into those families. And then those families brought in the worship of those Canaanite gods. So they followed the practices. If you worship a specific god, let's say it's Baal, then you're going to follow the practices of Baal. Okay, And so that's what they were doing. They were following the practices of the Canaanite gods. And then it makes it even worse. And then they followed the practices of some of the kings of Israel that some of the kings of Israel had had introduced. Remember, Jeroboam uh, introduced. He brought. He molded. He had cast these two golden calves, which kind of takes us back to Aaron's golden calf that he did while Moses was up getting the Ten Commandments. So he put one one in the northern part of the kingdom, and one in the southern part of the kingdom. So. And then he, is, he said, okay, now these are your gods, Israel. And then he also put Asherah poles, which is kind of like Mrs. God, up in, in those two places. And so he said, look, you don't need to go to Jerusalem. You can just go to these two places and worship these two calves. Mm -hmm. So those are the practices that he's referring to here that the kings of Israel had introduced. There's detailed evidence here that's going to get presented. The Israelites secretly did things against the Lord their God that were not right. You remember, God is light and in him there's no darkness where all of a sudden they're doing things that are corrupt. He said, from watchtower to fortified city, they built themselves high places in all their towns. I'm not going to focus too terribly much on what this high place thing is all about. But throughout the Bible, there are des descriptions of high places. Uh, I guess probably the earliest description of a high place was the Tower of Babel. And the point of the Tower of Babel is that men decided that they were going to go up to heaven and make themselves like God. And then God, looking down from heaven, said, we can't let that happen. So they destroyed the Tower of Babel and confused everybody's language. Now, there have been other high places as the Old Testament goes along. There are other high places where... where uh, Altars are built, uh, things are sacrificed, and, and those are all okay. But then once the temple in Jerusalem is established, all other high places are null and void in Scripture. They become second best. They become other than, okay? So the high place, the only high place that is revered in the Old Testament once the temple has been built is in Jerusalem. It's the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. That is the high place because that is where God resides. You may remember the story of uh, Jesus and the woman at the well, and she's at, at the base of Mount Gerizim, and there was, of course, a high place up there where people in wor worshiped in ancient times. For her, it was ancient times, back in the Northern Kingdom times. And she said, well, you know, our people worship God up there, and your people worship God in Jerusalem. And, and Jesus said, well, Quite frankly, Jerusalem is the only acceptable high place, but in the future, and by the way, the future is now because he is Jesus, okay, people will worship God in spirit, spirit and in truth, spirit, okay? Yeah. So that's kind of cool. But high places, it it, it, but instead of just having these two high places, as they drifted further and further into idolatry, everybody got into the act. Whether it was just a hill outside of town or a place that they just put up a mound of dirt, it didn't seem to matter. Every town and every town's people decided we're going to have our, our own high place where we can go to worship our version of God. And in all of those high places, they built an altar where they would offer sacrifices and they built an Asherah pole because... After all, the altar was there for their male god, and the Asherah pole was there for their female god. So that everybody had the same kind of layout there. And then he said they set up sacred stones and Asherah poles. I guess I got ahead of myself. Asherah poles in every high hill and under every spreading tree. Wow. 
It's kind of like Baptist churches in the South. <laughs> there's literally one on every corner. I guess the better example would be that there's, it's kind of like Starbucks in most cities. There's wow. one sometimes right across the street from each other. At every high place, they burned incense, as the nations whom the Lord had driven out before them had done. They did wicked things, and those wicked things were because they were worshiping less than God, and because they were worshiping idols, they did what the idols, worshiping idols, were, were required them to do, and because of that, they were doing corrupt and wicked things, and that aroused the Lord's anger. Now, I'll go back to Deuteronomy, and we're going to take a look at what Moses warned. He said, you should, must not worship the Lord your God in the way that, that they worship their idols, because when they worship their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things that the Lord hates. And then he says, let me just give you one example of something that they do that the Lord hates. They burn, they even, it's so extreme, they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to their gods in an effort to get their sins forgiven and to win their idol gods uh, favor, they give up their firstborn or maybe even more of their children to try to buy their way into the good graces of their idol god. Mm -hmm. Once more, the high place, remember Babel, they tried to get into heaven and be like God. Well, this giving of your sons and daughters, these detestable things are an effort that people are making to get the favor of their gods and win God's favor, their God's favor. He says, they worshiped idols, though the Lord had said, you shall not do this. It's the first and second commandment. If nothing else survived for 700 years, you would have thought the Ten Commandments would have survived somewhere on somebody's wall. These commandments had to be available, and all they had to do was read the first and the second, and that would have kept them out of trouble. Now, as far as God is concerned, he did, was not silent while they were on this downward spiral, drifting into corruption, worshiping idols. He was not quiet. He had people called prophets and seers, and they were constantly warning the people that what they were doing was leading to something bad. It says in verse 13, the Lord warned Israel and Judah through all of his prophets, whether it's, a, whether it's a, a Elijah or Elisha, or we'll get into next quarter, we'll get into Amos and we'll get into uh, Hosea, uh, all of these prophets were about the same time and they were trying their best to warn everybody that things were not going to end well. And all these prophets, they had one message, you've got to turn back to God. You've got to turn from your evil ways. And he reminded them of the covenant. He said, and observe my commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your ancestors to obey and that I delivered to you through my servants, the prophets, okay? Listen to my prophets and you will stay out of trouble. But what did they do? Instead of listening to the prophets, they didn't want to hear what they had to say, so they killed most of the prophets. But they refused to listen, and this is judgment. This is where the judgment comes. Even though they had the covenant, even though they were reminded of the covenant, they refused to turn and return back to God. They wanted to worship their idols. And so... He says here in verse 14, this is the court reporter, but they would not listen and they were stiff-necked as their ancestors who did not trust in the Lord their God. They rejected his decrees and his covenant that he'd made with their ancestors and his statutes that he had warned them that they needed to keep. Then they continued to become more corrupt. They followed worthless idols and they themselves became worthless. You, this is so good. You worship a, a good God and you become more like a good God. You worship a gracious God, you become more gracious. You worship a merciful God, you become more merciful. You worship a loving God, you become more loving. But when you worship a less than God, you become less than. You become yes, worthless as the idols that you're worshiping. Mm -hmm. It says, they imitated the nations around them. Although God had ordered them, don't do that. Mm -hmm. They did it anyway. 
They forsook all the commands of the Lord their God and made for themselves, remember what uh, Jeroboam, or, yeah, Jeroboam did when he became king. He, he said they, he cast two idols, cast in the shape of calves, and then he put an Asherah pole right next to it. You don't like the calf, then worship the Asherah pole. You don't like Mr. God, work, worship Mrs. God. They bowed down to all the starry hosts. Then it got even worse. They created these idols based on the creation. Okay, we're going to worship the sun. We're going to worship the stars. We're going to worship the moon. We're going to worship rain and thunder, the thing that brings the crops. So that would be Baal. Okay, so they, they bowed down to all the starry hosts, and then they worshiped even uh, Baal. Idolatry then led to corruption, and the corruption led to injustice. First of all, Verse 17, they sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire. Secondly, they practiced divination and they sought omens. The reason that this is so corrupt is because God said, if you will be my people, I will be your God. I will provide for you. I will take care of you. I, will, I have a plan for your life. You don't need to worry about the future because the future is in my hands and you are in my hands and therefore I've got this. Instead, because they weren't worshiping the God who of the creator uh, of the universe, they then needed to find out, wonder what the best investment's going to be in the stock market. I wonder what's going to happen next month in Russia. Or, you know, uh, I wonder what China's going to do because we've gone to see uh, the people in Taiwan. Okay, so they started saying, oh, we need to know the future. Why? Because they believed if they knew the future, they could avoid the consequences, but God said, you don't understand, I hold the future and there will be consequences. And then third thing they did was they sold themselves to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, which then made him even more angry. He knew that once they started worshiping the less than God, they would become more corrupt. And that was the last straw. So the Lord was very angry with Israel. So the verdict of a good judge, after all the evidence, based on the law, is given. So the Lord was very angry with Israel, that's the northern kingdom, and he removed them from his presence. Only the tribe of Judah was left. I wish that this next part wasn't also in there, but we know when we read the rest of the book exactly what happens. Verse 19. Oh, by the way, Judah is not a lot better than Israel. The only thing Judah had going for him was they had the line of David, which was the line of the Messiah. Otherwise, they would be 12 lost tribes of Israel. Verse 19, and even Judah didn't keep the commands of the Lord their God. They followed the practices that Israel had introduced. In other words, remember when Baal came in through Jezebel, then Jezebel's daughter married over into Judah. Well, guess what? Then they followed Baal as well both the north and the south. Therefore, the Lord rejected all the people of Israel. He afflicted them, gave them into the hands of plunderers. We know now that Israel and the southern kingdom are going to go into exile. So he thrust them. This is the second time he's done it. He thrust them from his presence. The summary for the lesson. The exile, we talked a couple of weeks ago when we, when we had those, uh, those four uh, uh, lepers who found out that God had provided relief from uh, the uh, from the, the siege and that the whole type of that lesson was that God provides and that theme goes from Genesis all the way through Revelation God is a God who provides life when when death is imminent God is the God who provides life uh, we are dead in our sins he provides life in Christ okay so that's a theme that goes throughout but another theme that's camped right on top of that one that goes all the way from one end to the other of the Bible is the theme of exile when people reject God, he must separate them from his presence, just like he got through telling Israel and Judah that he's going to do. And all you have to do is go back and look. Adam and Eve were separated from the Garden of Eden and from the presence of God. In the days of Noah, people were separated from God. As a result, they were drowned. Okay, only Noah survived. In Sodom and Gomorrah, they had become so corrupt that God had to separate them from their lives. He destroyed them. And then in this week's lesson, Israel, and then in a couple more weeks, Judah are, are separated from God. But all of those are just shadows. Those are just shadows. They're pictures of the great separation, the great exile. And the great exile is we are born 
separated from God. Our spirits are dead within us. We must be reunited from that exile. And that's where the provision of God comes in because he sees that we are separated and he provides that life through Christ for us. So this whole lesson, this whole episode of them going into exile, all of the exile examples that I've got here on the screen, those are all the theme of us. They're about us being exiled from God's presence and returning. Rejecting God leads to self-worship. Now, you don't hear a lot about idolatry in the New Testament, but it's there. It's there because it's called living in the flesh, living according to the flesh, Paul talks about. Self-worship in the New Testament is idolatry. That leads to dissipation. That means squandering or wasting your life or violence or injustice. Those are the things that happen when we worship ourselves. We become prideful, arrogant, and then things don't go well from there. The conclusion of the lesson is this. First thing that pops into my head, why is God so against idolatry? I mean, let's face it. That's really what we've been studying about for the last 11 weeks. Well, it turns out that God is completely good. And when you worship any other God, either one you made up or one that somebody else made up, whether it's Hare Krishna or Buddha or whoever else you're going to worship, those gods are less than good, okay? By definition, according to the word of God, God is the only good God. Therefore, any other God that you worship, even if it's yourself, is less than good. And when you worship a less than God, you become less than God's image. And then when you are less than God's image, you're going to treat others is less than two. And that brings injustice. And God hates injustice. So why is God so big on idol worship? Because he knows that when we worship some God other than him, that we're worshiping a less than God. And when we worship a less than God, we become less than. And when we become less than, we treat others less than. Ooh. And that is the spiral that the Israel and Judah went through. So why is God so against idolatry? All the law can be summed up as this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and body. Love others as yourself. But as Christians, <clears throat> as Christians, we have a new command. Jesus says, as I have loved you, meaning as I have given my life for you, you then need to love others. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we love a God who loved us so much that he died for us, just to bring us back from our exile. So what about this exile theme? Well, it says, the Bible says, we've all, like Israel, fallen short of God's glory. God is good, we're not so much. We're separated from God. God sent Jesus, his son, to keep the law. He perfectly kept the law. Only person who's ever done it, okay? And yet, he died anyway to pay for our shortfall. So he kept it perfectly, didn't deserve to die. He was innocent, but he died anyway so that we then could be forgiven, restored, and recreated. Recreated means we've been given a new heart, been given a new mind, mm -hmm. and we've been given a new spirit. Yes. So that by believing in his sacrificial death and resurrection, we are then saved. You have a choice. I have a choice. You know and I know that we have put ourselves ahead of God out of selfishness. I've got stories that I could tell you, but don't want to tell you about how I have done selfish things that have hurt not only me, but also others in my life. And you know they've hurt God. As David said, against you and only you have I sinned, God. And then he has written all of these exile stories to let us know that he wants us back. He wants us back. They're not in there just for entertainment purposes. There's a reason he wants us back. And he gives you and I a very simple path through faith in Jesus. And he says to us, you've got all these high places. You've got these goals, these aspirations, these dreams, these hopes in your life that however you came up with them, by whatever selfish God you were worshiping at the time, quit going to those high places. Just like the people in the Tower of Babel, you're not going to get to God that way. You're not going to gain God's favor no matter what you and I 
try to do. Stop trying to get to God because God brought the high place to us. We don't have to go to our high places to find God. God brought the high place to us. He brought the only high place that we're ever going to need. And it was on a hill called the skull. And it was on a cross. And that's our high place. That's where we go to find the presence of our Father God. Pray with me. Father, it's so very sad to read this exile story and yet it is the story of each and one, every one of our very own lives. It's my story. It's your story. If you're watching this, it's our story about being selfish, mm -hmm. about following our own wants and desires instead of turning back to the God who created us and worshiping him and him alone. Because he is good, worshiping him through Jesus Christ, we become better. We become more like him. We get the mind of Christ. We, Father, can learn how to be righteous, the righteousness of Christ, because that's how you see us, and that's why you died for us. We were in exile, but you wanted us back, yes. and you brought the high place from heaven to earth so that we could know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's a good lesson, even though it's a sad lesson. Now, we've got a couple more lessons uh, that are a little brighter than this one. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to go into some of the minor prophets. Minor only because the books are shorter, but uh, Amos and Hosea are a couple of them. Uh, we're going to also hit Jonah, the whale guy, uh, in the middle. But <laughs> we have a couple of prophets that also go back to this particular point in time in First and Second Kings. Until we see you next week, stay healthy, be safe, and know that we love you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.